UNO has always been an expanding university, constantly moving forward. But as we move forward, we must also look back to where we began. Let's go back in time with the people who remember UNO the way it was. Join us for Reflections in Time. It's uh, April of 1989. It's a rather nice spring day here in Omaha. And we're not just in Omaha, we're on the campus of the University of Nebraska at Omaha, as we call it now. And we're about to do something in one of their fine new buildings called the Health, Physical, Education, and Recreation Building called Reflections in Time. It's a series that we began working with many, many years ago. I had the feeling that a lot of people came and went here and devoted much of their lives to our university, and we didn't have many things with which to remember them. And so with the advent of videotape, television, that sort of thing, it seemed with the state of the art the way it was that we could do uh, some fine things with the many of the people who decided to retire or leave after many years of service to the university. And so we began doing it. Now we have about 50 hours of our reflections. We're going to continue that today with a friend of mine who's been a colleague of mine here for a lot of years. I'm speaking of Dr. Gordon Hansen, who's been a member of our faculty for a long time and in more recent years an assistant dean in the college of which I'm a part the College of Arts and Science. Gordon, I'm glad you could stop by today in your last month here on campus and take a little time to, to visit. Well, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. Gordon, you and I have known each other for a lot of years, but I don't know that I ever really asked you. I vaguely know where you came from, and that was Council of Buffs, but more than that, about your early life. Tell us about life as a boy, and we'll bring it on up to date, but things started across the river for you, right? Right. I... My father was a general contractor in the construction business, and I was in, uh, raised, as you say, in Council Bluffs, Iowa. And uh, father also had uh, owned a lumber company at that time. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, uh, basically, I started college. Well, after I got out of high school, I decided to go to college, and that was about 1945. And I went to the University of Omaha at that time. And at that, uh, of course, at that point, the university was burgeoning with students. We had about a thousand students on this campus, uh, all in the Arts and Science Hall, or now uh, at that time was called the Administration Building. You remember the campus then? It was really just a building, almost, wasn't it? That's correct. It was just a building, and a um, quite a new building, a, really. Wasn't very it? new, and it was the only air-conditioned campus in the United States yeah. at that time, and yeah. it was very nice. It was quite cool, and the. Uh, of course, it was a strong uh, uh, supply of, of veterans going to school at that particular point in time. And I was starting out in engineering, and I went for a year and basically found out I wasn't interested in engineering, either that or wasn't motivated or something of that nature, mm -hmm. and dropped out of school. And I went back to Council Bluffs, and my father uh, wanted me to go into business with my brother and himself, and so I did. And for 14 years, I remained in the lumber business with him. Did you? And to sort of said goodbye to that's college right. activity. But I got interested after about 10 years of that, of coming back to school. So I came back over to the University of Omaha. Let's pause there for a second. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You went out in the business world for quite a while there. That's correct. Do you remember why you said, hey, I want to go back to school? Basically, I... I wasn't that fond of, of the business world itself and what I was involved in. It was something to do, and I was trying to please my father uh, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. And I really um, um, found myself wanting to get back into academic life. And so I started taking some night classes at the University of, uh, of Omaha. And uh, intriguing enough, in 1959, I was enrolled in a French class out here. I was still single. I was. Uh, um, I had a lot of activities. I loved to go fishing and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things. So I remained single for quite a while. But I was enrolled in a, a French class at night uh, with Norman Zinn, who was teaching the class at that point oh, yeah. in time. And I met the uh, young lady in there named Shirley Kelly, who uh, uh, had gone to the same high school I had, but I knew of her, but had never met her before. Which one was it? Thomas Jefferson? No, Abraham Lincoln. Ah. Okay. All right. And so. Uh, uh, during coffee breaks, I talk, talked to her a few times, and then, of course, the inevitable asked her for a date, and the first thing you know, we were going steady and got married in the uh, June of uh, 1960. Ah. And at that point in time, decided that uh, 
I really wanted to go into the academic life as a profession. My wife was very supportive in more ways than one. I mean, she worked uh, the, very much like some of the things in the military. She worked to get me through school. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I came back to school full time and got my baccalaureate in 62. You really settled in then to do it. That's correct. And my wife continued to take coursework uh, also as an undergraduate. Well, I. Uh, uh, went through in 62, I uh, graduated, and then did my master, uh, signed up for a master's degree program in psychology. Well, you were stuck out. right in it. Right, and uh, got an assistantship, which helped uh, make my mind up about going through the program, uh -huh. and uh, went through that to get my master's degree. Any special reason why you picked psychology or it Well, it was in interesting. I think that's another thing that decided I wanted to go into the academic realm is uh, just fortuitously I picked a psychology course at night to take because it was a convenient time. Uh -huh. And I had taken it, uh, I can't remember just when that would have been, probably around 1956, something like that, and found out I really enjoyed the subject. And so I continued on to follow through with that. And then in 63, um, the department hired me as an assistant instructor, and I continued to pursue the academic uh, realm, so to speak. Uh, uh, arranged to uh, study for a doctorate at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, mm -hmm. where I finally earned my doctorate. But uh, essentially, was on the faculty here from the fall of 1963 onward. Had you intended to teach when you decided to go back to school? I really did. I intended to go clear through to the doctorate, mm -hmm. and I got a lot of support from. Uh, Jack Newton and Bill Janes were both here at that particular point, and Bill Pedrini, and they all gave me a lot of support in terms of doing this. And it was yeah, the a former head of your psychology right. department and our dean now and that all that correct. sort of thing. Right. And Bill Pedrini, who's still That's on our correct. faculty. That's correct. He's still here. there. Right. Yeah, a lot of people influence and help us in making our decisions, really, right. that we don't often think about, even at the time, do we? Right. It was, you know, it was those people and my wife, for example, it was just interesting. I always felt education paid off more ways than one. I, if I had not got interest, I would not have met my wife. No. And, it, no. uh, and uh, it's been great. Uh, we both have very similar interests, obviously. Uh -huh. and it, uh, yes, your wife has been busy. Oh, oh yeah, and this, too, incidentally, in 63, we had a daughter. Uh, she had two children by a previous marriage, and uh, we had a daughter in 63 and then a son in 66. So she kind of slowed down in her progress towards a degree and then was able, uh, after the kids got older, to come back to school and get her uh, bachelor's degree in library science and has worked over in the reference department of the library for the last... Uh, I'm trying to remember, seven, ten years, or something oh, like that. Oh, yeah. So it's been a family affair, really. That's correct. Yeah. Now, uh, <clears throat> I think it's fun when we visit on these reflections, Gordon, to to reflect uh, about a lot of things. And one thing, when you came here as a student and later as a faculty mm -hmm. member, this campus was uh, different then, wasn't it? It was quite different when I first came here. It was a <laughs> uh, University of Omaha. Milo Bale was a president. Milo Bale, of course, was a... Um, some people call him a benevolent dictator or whatever. <laughs> a lot of people call him a lot of different things. He High was, profile, let's yes, say. <laughs> he was a, an individual that was known for being able to squeeze a nickel hard enough so the Indian would be riding the buffalo, if you remember yeah. the old Indian nickels. <laughs> but uh, he could get a lot of mileage out of it. The university was run from, uh, as far as a monetary standpoint, very efficiently, very effectively. And it, uh, he did great things as far as that part was concerned. The other things some people didn't particularly like about it. but. Uh, there were, it was a dress code, obviously. Uh, generally speaking, the male students always had shirts and ties on, and the young ladies were required to wear skirts. Yeah, there were no women were, were just weren't allowed to wear slacks, were they, Gordon? That's correct. I can remember one instance at the university library where a student who had, was not on, had come off from off campus and wanted to use the library. She was a regular student, but it was at times she was not in class, so. It was colder weather. She had her coat and she was wearing slacks and wanted to go in the library and they would not let her enter the library because <laughs> she had her slacks on. So she went into the women's restroom and took her slacks off and stuffed them in her handbag or whatever and was allowed to come into the university because then it appeared that she was wearing a skirt. So she was able to come in and use the library <laughs> at that point. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the rules and regs were, were a bit different, weren't they? They certainly were. About uh, food should be eaten in the cafeteria and that's All these right. other things. Uh, in the student lounge, you were not to sleep in or right. in the nature, and you weren't even supposed to study in there. It was, uh, 
Dust to lounge, whatever that really meant. Yeah, right. right. Uh, in other words, it wasn't really for anybody to use is what but, it boiled down to. But, you know, in those days, too, we had not as nearly as many students as we have now, Gordon, but we had a lot of students, yes. a lot of faculty. And the, the it was a different place, wasn't it, uh, than the student body the we student, have today, don't you? Right. The student body was quite different. Of course, when I came back to school full-time, it was when the bootstrap influx was oh, going on. Yeah. As you recall, Curtis LeMay and Milo Bale got together and and devised a program where the people in the military that were even close to graduation could complete their degree. The bootstrappers uh, were regarded rather fondly by the other students as curve raisers, yeah. uh, as you probably other know. Other for them, too. Yes, right. they, uh, they were great students. They were fantastic oh. students. Yeah. They set the academic tone for the campus. They pulled but everybody I, along. But they? I competed with them myself uh, until I became a faculty member and then had them as students. Mm -hmm. But uh, the uh, situation was basically that you really had to work. You had to be a very serious student or you couldn't cut it here. And uh, that was the situation with the bootstrappers. And that re reminds me of another uh, story that was rather interesting. Back in the early 60s, there was a national magazine called Confidential that, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. that um, somewhat like National Enquirer, but it was a magazine rather than a newspaper. Uh -huh. And they would write exposés periodically. And uh, this, in 1962, <laughs> the University of Omaha was chosen as their target. And on the cover of this magazine, they had a picture of the administration building, and it said, Omaha U, rah, 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 R-A-W, R-A-W, R-A-W. <laughs> Milo Bale knew about this coming out, and Milo was determined that no one was going to see this to hurt the image of the campus. And someone else, and I never could figure out how he did it, he was able to get that magazine removed from every newsstand in Iowa and Nebraska. And so right? you couldn't get it. I did get to see the magazine because some of the bootstrappers had them flown in to off at Air Force Base, <laughs> so they had them on campus. But it, uh, it was... Uh, portraying the uh, University of Omaha as somewhat of a party school and that there were these wild parties going on and so forth. Uh, apparently, a lot of people must have read it because our enrollment just about doubled the next year. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I hadn't heard all the details of that story. You described it was very interesting. And he really got it off the newsstands. He did get it off the newsstands. You could not get it from anybody uh, uh, because I tried both Iowa and Nebraska. But, uh, <laughs> Well, I hope we have one in the archives. I hope have. so, too. I really don't know if there is or not, but it would be great if there were. Yeah. yeah. Now, of course, when you came, whether you describe it as a student or a little later when you started to be a member of the teaching faculty, mm -hmm. Gordon, we didn't offer quite as many things as we do today, I don't think, in the way of programs, or at least in the depth that we have them mm -hmm. today. What were the things that a young man or woman could get involved with, as you recall it, when you first came here? Well, basically, uh, as far as there were several colleges, yeah. uh, the College of Education was, at the time I came in here, a part of the Arts and Science College, and I can't remember if the Business Administration was at that time, or right about that time, it split off into a separate college. I think it was separate. Right. And we also had it a had college. It had been a school for a while and became a college. And we had a College of Applied Arts, mm -hmm. which now is the Engineering College. Correct. But uh, those things were rather close together, and the uh, Student Center had a, um, a faculty dining room, which was really great because it, uh, it was, uh, had the, all the amenities, you might think, uh, heavy maple furniture and yeah. captain's chairs, and you sat down with faculty from various departments and got to visit with them and things of that nature, and it was, it was highly intriguing. You got to know people, didn't you? Right. And one individual, I really got a kick out. Wilford Payne was the chairman of the philosophy department, yeah. and he was an interesting individual, an excellent teacher. But uh, I know one day we were sitting at the table, and there were some strangers at the table with us. Uh, several of them sitting around, and there were about three strangers there. And so Payne uh, asked them a lot of questions, and then found out that they knew something about pipe organs. And so he directed the conversation around pipe organs for the topic of a conversation about lunch. And after they had left, uh, because they were there before us, Payne turned to me and he said, "Well, he says, if there are strangers around, I find out." you know, what they know about that I know about so I can lead the conversation so I can talk about something I know about. <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, he loved to lead the conversa yes. conversation, didn't he? Right. Interesting man. Now, that was a great place. That, there's a lot of camaraderie that we lose now because of diversity of where people eat and That's all that right. sort of thing. That, yeah, that was, was the place. It was, you, there, was no, there were no departments, there were no colleges, everybody. You, you just you sat down at the table of their space and you visited and you knew everybody. Now I, I doubt if I know half the faculty yeah. that are on this campus. Indeed so. Now, <coughs> uh, when you came, or as you stayed really, you mm -hmm. might say came and went, came back, that sort of thing, and remember the, the psychology back and first as a 
uh, teaching assistant, something right. of that nature, right? right? That's for your first taste of teaching. Right. What was that like, Gordon? I thought it was great. Um, I enjoyed that very much. One of the things, of course, I did find out, my first teaching assignment was for summer school, the accelerated session. And I'd never been fully responsible for a course by myself, and so I... Uh, was I was a person who was always very well prepared, so I went through and I made up lectures to cover the first two weeks of the class. And I was going to be teaching a night class, would meet like three hours a night, yeah, uh, twice a, long a week. Time. And the, uh, because I was somewhat nervous and so forth, I used up my first two weeks of lectures the first night of the class. <laughs> and of course, uh, really had to work then to be prepared for the rest of the, of the course as we went <laughs> through it. And it, uh, I thought it was a very good experience, however, doing that because it. Uh, uh, help prepare me for the fall. When my first fall, I had a 17-hour teaching load, although I only had three preparations. I think it was at that particular point in time. But now you you uh, did what so many faculty members and our colleagues have done. You you were a student and a graduate student at the same time, off and on for right. a long time. That's correct. Right. Yeah, it, a lot of us did that. In fact, the matter is, I have noted several of our faculty. In fact, some of our very good faculty here were undergraduate students on this campus, and many of them went away and did their doctorates elsewhere. And then because they had such a fond uh, feelings for this campus, wanted to come back here mm -hmm. and become part of the faculty. And so you could go, I could name uh, many of the faculty here that actually took their undergraduate degrees. You mentioned Orv Menard earlier yes. on, and Orv was a uh, undergraduate here originally and took his doctorate and came back here. I think Carl teach. Dahlstrom, too. Dahlstrom, Jerry Simmons. Um, a lot of them in our college. Right. Yeah. Yeah. which speaks well for the community and, right. and for the university, too, I think. That's correct. Uh, another thing that's different about 1989 and the years when you and I were here and much younger as things were going in the early 60s, let's say, let's take that as a yeah. time, we were a municipal university. That's right. That's how you got to know the place when you were over in Council Bluffs, even, the Municipal University of Omaha. Uh, that was different too, wasn't well, it? Well, it was really different, basically. I was working on my doctorate at the time that the merger was starting to take place. And so uh, uh, on the Lincoln campus, I had uh -huh. a rather unique opportunity to listen and hear the comments going on by faculty as they were thinking about what was going to happen when the merger took place. Oh, yeah. You know, it, um, many were excited. I think some of them felt that they were going to take over the campus. Uh, others. Uh, of course, one of my instructors was mentioning in class about one of there's going to be because the uh, University of Omaha would get all these fringe benefits that Lincoln had. And he started naming them after class. I went up to him. I said, you know, I said I, uh, I have an uh, instructorship there, basically at UNO and I or at University of Omaha at that time. And I said, all the things you've mentioned, we have. And uh, oh well, he got very interested in it and started talking to me and wanted to know if I could bring down the, a package of our fringe benefits, which I did. And, of course, astounded uh, many of them down there because they found out we actually had better fringe benefits they than they had. They did. And so it, uh, <laughs> uh, one of the things where equity was brought about, in many instances it was not, but at least in one instance where equity was brought about is that they, they did make the fringe benefits equal for both campuses. Yes. We lost some things and they gained some things, so we came out uh, equivalent in that area. You know, that was kind of a tough period. Certainly because was. a lot of us had been around here for a long time as being our city university, really. Right. And a lot of us uh, were kind of leery of all this. What were your feelings back in those days? You said, as yeah. you just mentioned, that you were going to school down there, but you were still here. This was your place, really. Well, I what had, were your feelings about it? Okay, there? I had some severe reservations, primarily because there were a lot of faculty I had talked to. One of them had been in the University of Nebraska. A couple others had been in other state institutions. And many of them had chosen to come to what you might call virtually a private institution because the bureaucracy of state institutions was something they could not stomach mm -hmm. is what it really boiled down to. Mm -hmm. And so quite a few of them left here and went elsewhere because they said they did not want to become part of a state's uh, 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 campus. Uh, Jack Newton, of course, was the... Um, uh, Bill James was one of them that left, and Jack Newton became chair of the department. And Jack was willing to s wait it out and see what would happen. Jack has pretty much an open mind on a lot of things, and it, uh, uh, he, he proved to be correct. Pretty much uh, everything he predicted would take place has taken place. The department had started momentum towards uh, developing a doctoral program, and it, it, uh, the merger did not stop that. In fact, if anything, it probably helped it. 
did bring about where now we can offer three doctoral programs in psychology here yeah. on campus. Mm -hmm. And I really don't think that would have occurred or would have been greatly delayed if we had not become part of the state system. Well, very simply, we were just running out of money too, weren't we? We were and we weren't. Some of the things, you know, you hear recently now that Carney is being considered for part of the system, and I read some editorials out of the Lincoln newspaper when they say that U University of Wilmot was bankrupt and, and that they, uh, after the merger we got the student center and all these sorts of things. Uh, they haven't studied their history very well, as no. you probably know. The student center was built prior to that time. Yeah. The money was already allocated to build All Wine Hall. We did not owe any money, and we had about, I think it was at the time, around a half a million dollars uh, in uh, cash sitting in the bank. We didn't have a lot of money, but we were solvent. We were definitely solvent. They did not take over a failing institution. No. No. I think the main thing that probably would have happened is we might have had to restrict enrollment or something because we were splitting at the seams. We were growing too fast and we didn't have the money to provide the facilities to, uh, to uh, service the people in Nebraska is what it boiled down yeah, to. Yeah, there was about a thousand students when you came here as a student and at the time of the merger we had more like six thousand, something like that, and within about two years after the merger we were up around eleven thousand. Yeah. And so it, uh, we were really straining at the walls at that particular point in time. Wasn't one of the things that bothered some of us here on campus about the merger the fact that it took place seemingly so quickly? It took very quickly. Uh, uh, faculty, I think, felt kind of left out of it. We didn't seem to have a lot of decision. It was almost like uh, it was done behind closed doors, obviously, and all at once it was there. Uh, a lot of the faculty here uh, would have preferred to have been called Nebraska State University mm -hmm. and rather than part of the University of Nebraska, and probably some of the people in the University of Nebraska-Lincoln felt the same way. Yeah. Uh, I guess time will tell. I'm not sure which route had been the best at this point in time. But as you reflect on the years since the merger, which was, as I recall, 68, right. uh, we're talking about 10, 11, uh, uh, 20 years, rather. That's 20 right. Years, not, uh, a lot of time just has passed since it took place. And now it is a different place, isn't it? Very much so. It was interesting. The um, uh, Roskins came on campus. A lot of people were upset uh, because he... Uh, Roskins delegated authority very well, mm -hmm. and, but he demanded accountability, and it uh, changed the nature of this campus. The campus grew tremendously under him, academically and, and otherwise. Uh, he was a powerful spokesman for the campus. Yeah, he was quite different from Bale, wasn't he? Right, very much so. Uh, yeah. Bale um, was more of a business manager. Um, uh, Roskins was both a good business manager and an academician. He was, uh, had the, the concept well in hand. He knew what the university needed, he knew where, where it needed to go, and he set the tone for it. When he left here, you know, a lot of people had misgivings, and I felt uh, how, you know, some things you were kind of nice to not have to deal with, but on the other hand, we felt the university would start sliding backwards because he no longer was here. And uh, Del Weber came, and he was an unknown quantity. Mm -hmm. And uh, thank goodness uh, Dell has been as strong or stronger than Roskins was, but in different areas. He has done things differently. It was, I guess you might call the zeitgeist. He, he came into the right spirit of the times and is able to accomplish things that need to be accomplished. Some of these things I felt would never be accomplished, mm -hmm. like a parking garage and the uh, science building. And so both Dell and, and, and Roskins both were uh, outstanding, uh, well, I shouldn't say were, and Dell still is, but uh, outstanding uh, builders of this campus. You speak really strongly about all these recent presidents, not so recent too. Right. Bale had his place and the others right. too in their time. Don't That's you? correct. Yeah, they all seem to fit the spirit of the times. We were lucky, you know, that the Bale was here when we had to pinch pennies, and he probably was extremely gifted at that. Yes. And so yes, and and then of course the merger created a whole host of different relationships. Very didn't much it? so. The yeah. interaction, you know, I was in a lot of committees between Lincoln and here, and I remember, so. resolving things, and it was uh, it was interesting. There was a lot of vitality, a lot of interest going on, and of course one of the things I was uh, probably was the epitome of what they wanted to accomplish overall is we became one graduate college, mm -hmm. which is great because. Uh, faculty from the Medical Center, faculty from your faculty from the Lincoln who meet the criteria set up for it are part of the graduate faculty, control them and run it. And it uh, yeah. In general, as you view the merger and what has taken place to date, and it's certainly an ongoing process, mm -hmm. uh, you sound very positive about it. Well, basically there are plus and minuses, but I'd say the pluses far outweigh the minuses. What do you think we lost in all of that? Autonomy, obviously. Um, 
Uh, I can remember as a uh, when I was uh, first assistant dean before the um, merger. You know, if you had a problem, you could usually in some of these problems you could resolve them with 10 minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes. After the merger, some of those problems could take weeks or months to resolve mm -hmm. because it's. Uh, uh, too many things get involved, but that's natural with any large organization. It, uh, uh, it slows certain things down. Do we just tend, do you feel, as you reflect on life generally and the university specifically here, that the thing gets bigger, that things become a little more cumbersome? Oh, definitely. Uh, very much more so. More, more people to answer to, more things you have to go through. It isn't just the university, it's also the change that the federal government has brought about. It's, it's not independent of each other, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, in all of this, whether we're a municipal university, Gordon, or a part of the state system, which we've been now for over 20 years of history, uh, this place has been full of people. Right. And uh, through your years here, a lot of them now, 30-some uh, probably, if you count all the student years and everything, it's a hunk of years. Yes, it is. Is. You've touched shoulders with a lot of people, and a lot of them you've forgotten, but I'm quite sure there are many that you remember well. And I think you'd agree with me that our university is made up not so much of buildings, but of people, right. students and faculty and staff. And what I'd like to have you do on our tape, your reflections, is just to uh, probe your memory sure. about stories and people, people that stand out and some of the things they contributed or some of the odd things that happened, mm -hmm. whatever, that'll add flavor to our remembrance of our, our university during your time here. Sure. Well, there Obviously, one of the first person uh, person would come to mind is Ralph Wardle, who is our, um, one of our English professors. Ralph, to me, was the epitome of a scholar. He, uh, he wrote well, he taught well, he gave fantastic lectures. He was a very human individual. Probably was the epitome of what a university professor, and he could have been on any campus and held his own with anybody, as far as is concerned. Yet, probably one of the most human individuals. I have generally found that the, 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 the more competent, the, the, the higher the standards a person sets and so forth, like Wardle, the more human they are. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it, uh, never uh, talk to a lowly freshman as a major uh, professor and, uh, and he would swear that he was uh, talking to a peer, you know, mm -hmm. never talk down to anybody at any level. He was excellent. Paul Beck was another dear soul, you oh, know, I in the history department. Uh, Fantastic instructor, fantastic individual, and sorely missed him when he passed on. Um, I was thinking about Ellen Lord. I might mention a little story again. Uh, Everybody has a story about Ellen Lord, right. don't they? <laughs> Ellen Lord was, of course, the head of the university library many years ago. And my wife and I were enrolled in the, um, as undergraduates in a uh, library orientation uh, course through the College of Education. And uh, Ellen Nord was in that day speaking to the class, which had around 125 students, and about three-fourths of them were bootstrappers, so it was very male-dominated. Uh, and the, uh, Ellen was uh, expounding on a new book called The Natural Superiority of Women. And uh, after she'd gone on for a minute, I couldn't resist. I raised my hand, and she called me, and I said, would this book be classified under fiction? <laughs> And uh, pandemonium <laughs> took place in the class. The bootstrappers are screaming and beating me on the back and everything. And uh, <laughs> Eleanor carried it off very well. She How did she no, handle it? She, after the things calmed down, she says, no, this is definitely not fiction. And she went on and she <laughs> laughed. I mean, she had a good sense of humor. Yes, she did. But my wife <laughs> uh, sent that story into Argosy magazine at that point in time. And at that time, we were pinching pennies. And I did, uh, you know, it was about... Oh, six weeks later, lo and behold, we got a check in the mail for $100 uh, for the story. So that, that was your most lucrative day in class that's ever, right, brother. That's right. <laughs> that's one time when the sense of humor paid <laughs> off. But uh, uh, generally, I found that most of the faculty here have not taken themselves too seriously. They can laugh at themselves. They can laugh what goes on, you know, make a mistake in front of their class yeah. and, and enjoy it. Um, I've got uh, four children. Uh, three of them have attended class here. Mm -hmm. I can remember one of them that um, uh, came home one time. He was so enjoying a physics class he was taking with Don Schultz. He says, "He says Schultz gets so excited up in front that he starts stuttering. You know, he, he says it. Uh, he just, you know, he just so thoroughly enjoyed the class. Uh -huh. we, we have so many teachers like that here. Menard, of course, is a par excellent teacher. Uh, you can go on down the line. Uh, I could name so many names, and uh, some of them I'll, I'll leave out, obviously. Oh, but sure. it, uh, uh, I can remember some of the instructors I had as, as time went by that were uh, uh, just uh, just fantastic. You, know, yeah, you don't forget them, do you? No, you really don't. No. 
It's, I think of another person from our past that uh, you might comment on, and I think of him often, and that's Harold Kefauver. Yeah, Harold Kefauver, the, uh, our comptroller, and of course, uh, the uh, University of Omaha got the name of being a campus for handicapped people where it really wasn't designed that way, but it just uh, certain special things were done to accommodate Harold because Harold was in a wheelchair. and uh, t He was worth accommodating, too. Yes, he was. What a man. Harold was a real great uh, person. In fact, we had so many great people here. At, uh, it was, uh, and, and it's kind of interesting that we did because there were a lot of problems and the salaries weren't so great and there were a lot of places to go, but somehow, even in the early years, and I could talk to people go well back before your time, we had some very strong faculty members here. Well, you know, one of the reasons, and that was one of the things Bale did, and I think some people may have forgotten, AAUP used to rate salaries at universities. The University of Omaha was ranked the top in the country, you know, with the other uh, places, uh, the, the top in the country, I think AAA rating or something like that for assistant professors. Uh -huh. He paid assistant professors way above national average, but the associate dropped off, a uh -huh. full professor dropped off, to we're down to a C rating, I think it was, for full professor. Uh -huh. Uh, because of that, it attracted very, very strong assistant professors who came here, and then some stayed, but some left and went elsewhere after they uh, got their time in and, and whatever to move on to mm -hmm. something else. Well, we hooked a lot of people because of that approach. That's correct. Approach. Many of them wanted to stay here because mm -hmm. of it, so it, um, uh, but it was, it was a good, good approach, basically. So we were able to quali get very qualified. I know one of the individuals, I think it was, I can't remember if it was Payne or not, but someone had told me that they were offered uh, at Harvard and offered a position here, but paid so much more here, they came here. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> it, uh, that's back in the days when assistant professors started like $1,500 yeah, a year. Yeah. Hmm. Now, you know, a period that, of time that you were here, as I was, it was kind of interesting, and for some people, for most of us, I guess, a bit different were the 60s. Mm -hmm. People think of the 60s as being a great or a terrible time or something. Well, but the golden years. Yeah, yes. but it was a different time. Yeah. And the student and the way he interacted with us and we with him and all that sort of thing. Comment a little about that period mm -hmm. and your own reflections on it. Uh, the relationship between faculty and student at that time was much more formal. And I think that was mm -hmm. characteristic around the country. It was around the Vietnam era when things started changing rather dramatically. But uh, uh, we had some interesting people on campus. I remember Peter Fonda was mm -hmm. a student here about the same time I was a full-time student. And uh, Bob Harper was the uh, dean of the Arts and Science College, and I was working directly under him. He was also a professor in English. And he was talking about Peter one time, and it was kind of interesting. He said, uh, you know, he says, uh, Peter, of course, uh, took English courses from me. He said he was an excellent writer. He wrote very well. It was uh, interesting to hear the little uh, side things about someone yeah. who now has yeah. gone on to... Uh, uh, become a big name in the uh, movie industry. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but the period of uh, turbulence, mm -hmm. it really didn't affect us a lot here, did it, in a comparative way at least? Very little. We only had one escapade where a student sat in the president's yeah. office, and that was yeah. a, a one-day shot. But otherwise, uh, we were uh, obviously an older campus. Uh, students were older. The average age, I think even back then, was around 26, 27. Which is a bit older than the normal right. live-in campus, isn't right. it? Right. And most of those students uh, were very much uh, um, interested in the education. Many of them were paying their own tuition and so forth. And it, uh, um, darn near, we're not going to give up any of that thing for any uh, other things that might be going on. Uh, I can remember a couple of faculty who had taught at resident schools where the average age was around 18 or 19 that came here and, and said that they found that they, uh, they had to be very careful when they said things in class because students held them accountable. You know, they said no one ever questioned them when they were talking to uh, 18, 19, 20 years old, but you have a 27, 28, 29, 30 year old who's paying his own tuition and you make something, uh, they, uh, they want you to document what you're saying and they don't want you to dismiss classes. They don't want you to skip your class as a professor. They feel that they are being shorted for what they're yeah. paying for. Yeah. So there's a strong, serious side to the, the students that exist at that point in time. You know, the thing you just described is interesting, and I felt that that's really one of the strengths of our university. Mm -hmm. We have such a variety of ages. Right. Don't you think that's a strong factor in the strength that we have among our student body? It's great. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed teaching because I found whether you taught an af morning class, afternoon, or evening class, you had such a range of age of students. We've had students as young as 10 years, the high school prodigies going here as early entry yeah. students, and we've had them 80 years of age. Yeah. 
an in-between and you teach a normal class and obviously as you know we have uh, parents and their kids going here at the same time yes. uh, seeing who's going to graduate first or whatever and it, um, um, it, it's great uh, just to watch uh, what's going on. I visit with a lot of these people who have come back and they say well I'm so motivated now and it's true the older student sets the standard for the younger student. You know you were really a part of that yourself. You were here uh, and then came back a lot of years later and had a different outlook and approach right. to it didn't you? Philosophy was completely different. I could not get enough of it. I, uh, uh, I wasn't just satisfied with reading the textbook. If there was something interesting in the textbook that uh, referred to another journal or something I'd go over and read that. Uh, I wanted to learn. I loved the subject area. When I was first starting as a student, uh, I did the minimum, you mm -hmm. know. And mm -hmm. uh, and then as you get older and you become more interested in that thing and things are more stable as far as your overall life is concerned, you get so much more motivated. You know, uh, these last years, though, you have uh, we've talked about students and teaching. Oh, and before we left the the teaching end of it, I was wondering. Your thoughts on it? You've been a student. You've been a teacher for lots of years. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to make a little list, Gordon, one, two, three, four. What would you say as you've looked around? You mentioned Wardle. You mentioned other great teachers. You've been rubbed shoulders with them. You know them. And now and then, you and I have a great day as a teacher. What makes a to you a good teacher, Gordon? Well, a good teacher has a lot of things. First of all, they have to be excited about their subject area. They need to know it. And they need, it needs to be relevant, and they need to impart that to the student. They've got to, they got to uh, supply that. Obviously, you have to have motivated students too. Mm -hmm. And it, um, I discovered many years when I first started teaching, uh, um, there's a tendency someone you first start to uh, start thinking, well, the student can't really read the textbook on their own, so you start picking passages out of the textbook and discussing that. I discovered that, at least for as far as my methodology was concerned, that was not satisfactory. Uh, assign the students to read the textbook. Uh, you can have a discussion period to discuss the reading that they had need questions over. But your lectures should be parallel to, but not over the textbook. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tie those things together. That's what makes the course interesting. Because I found out with the professors I had. If they started talking about the textbook, it puts you to sleep because you can read the textbook yourself. You need somebody that goes beyond that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so th those things are exciting. And what's really exciting is you, I don't know what it is, it's either the, the um, nonverbal, there's a nonverbal communication that goes on between the professor and the student. And you can tell when things are going well and things are not going well. And I don't know how to describe it, but you're, you know that's your, your area at least. Uh, uh, something you can feel. You can feel it. Attention. You know that it's going or it's not going and how those things relate. And so you back up. You've got to be sensitive to it. And then you back up and if you need to and go over it or ask questions or whatever. And obviously uh, you need to ask questions in a class. It, it's, uh, that keeps the students alert too. And drop a little humor in occasionally. Sure. That's, uh, that's necessary. That's been your way. You're known as the punch to right. the campus. Right? And if a student gets one <laughs> up on you, laugh right along with them because yes. you enjoy, it, you know you, when you're the butt of the joke, it's funny. It really is. It's funny to yourself if you look at yourself. Yeah. You got to stand apart and look at yourself, and then it's hilarious. Yeah. You know, it's People a, take themselves too seriously. Can be awful much of a bore sometimes. That's can't correct. They? Yeah. Now these recent years, though, Gordon, you haven't spent as much time in the classroom. Not right. too many years ago, uh, Dean Newton asked you to come on board and gradually became more and more of an administrator. Right. And that's what you've been doing as an assistant dean. Tell us a little about that, your work there and okay. that sort of thing. I've How always enjoyed, enjoyed teaching, although I found it became very, very difficult to teach day classes um, because it conflicted too much with what you need to do in the office. So I got to the point where I did teach more night classes and then I got kind of tired of that. Uh, uh, I like to go home for supper and then I uh, hated to get up and come back to teach a class, although I would say that every time I got in the class, I loved it when yeah, I got here. Got the, here. Uh, night students were just as good or better than the day students. There was no problem with that. But I, um, uh, I got involved in the office and it um, uh, primarily been responsible for things like uh, uh, ex officio chair of the Educational Policy Committee, dealing with the curriculum, transcript evaluation, checking out students for graduation and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think helped me become a more effective administrator was a comment that Anston Marston made to me many, many, many years ago. It must be 20 some years ago. Anston was the Dean of the Applied Arts, Applied College. Arts College. And Anston said, if you make right rules that idiots can administer, they will. 
And that made such an impact on me <laughs> that, uh, by God, I was not going to become rule-bound when a student came in, or a transfer student or someone came in, and a rule was causing them a problem. The only reason it was causing a problem was because it was a rule. You know, then uh, it's more important that justice be served. So I'm known as somewhat of a person who bends rules mm -hmm. uh, to fit the occasion. And I, uh, Marge Wyckoff is my uh, assistant dean in the office, and I think she has somewhat adopted that philosophy too, that the um, that justice needs to be served. Um, you know, you can be a, an ogre, and you don't have to be. And we've had a lot of interesting and very rewarding for us transfer students that have come from a variety of places with a variety of backgrounds. Oh, that's we correct. Were. Very much so. Yeah. In fact, the matter is, one of the strengths of this campus is we have such a variety of students from a variety of places. That, uh, uh, I don't know what the real percentage is, but one time in a class I was teaching that had a relative of 100 students, I asked the students who had attended someplace else to raise their hands. Two-thirds of them had attended other campuses. Is that right? So it, uh, they have a perspective, and it's uh, and a, 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 they appreciate many of the things we do. Uh, many of them, a comment I've had, had for some many of these students is that the faculty are so accessible on this campus mm -hmm. uh, compared to where they had come from. I hear that time and again. One of them just a year or two ago went to a small uh, prestige liberal arts college here in the Midwest and said with a small class the faculty is so accessible and said they're much more accessible here than where she came from. Is that and, right? and really That's an interesting uh, observation. And switched here because of that. Now, uh, let's leave the campus, or not really leave it, we'll come back. But in our last minutes together, Gordon, now uh, you've decided in 1989 that it's time to do some other things. Right. And so you're planning, you and your good wife, to to retire. But uh, you've been doing it in a different way from some of us. You're not going to live right off campus. You're going somewhere else. Right. Tell us about what you've been doing and how this is going to work out in your lives now. Okay. About 40 years ago, I spent some time in northwestern Ontario fishing and became very enamored of the place, so much that in 1953 I bought a, a cabin up there. And then, of course, after I married my wife, she also uh, thoroughly loved that country. She was actually uh, born in, and lived for a period of time in Ashton, Wisconsin, in northern Wisconsin. Oh, yeah, way up in your right. spirit. And uh, loved that type of country, too. And so uh, uh, my wife is a great person for pushing me to do things, and I'm, I'm saying that in a positive sense. Uh -huh. you know, it, uh, she says if she hadn't done these things, we'd still sit in the cabin where you couldn't see out the windows for the trees. <laughs> um, she got me to open things up so you could see the lake and add on and so forth. So we started out with a rather small place up there, and now we have a, a, a two-level home that's 40 by 40 feet overall with you've a lot been, of space. You've been adding and adding to it, have you? Yes. Is the original cabin still there? The original cabin's buried in there someplace, yes. <laughs> and it... Um, uh, so uh, and it's we a have modern home. Uh, it's a modern home. It uh, yeah. Originally, when I had it, we had uh, the uh, four rooms and a path sort of thing. Uh -huh. And uh, I did put running water in, which is gravity fed and electricity with a pump. But uh, over a period of time, we kept adding on and adding on and adding on. And now it's it's fully modern, uh, plumbing and everything else of that nature, uh, with a nice deck out in front. My wife for. I don't know how many years, said it'd be nice to have a deck out in front, and finally I took the hint and put a deck, and of course I think I enjoy it as much as she does. Uh, she gets up on the morning up there in, in uh, the decent weather, and uh, if she was always popping out of bed before I do anyway, and if I happen to get up and look out, and there she's sitting on the deck eating a roll and drinking a cup of coffee looking at the lake, and that's often what we do in the mm -hmm. evening before supper or something like that. And it, uh, we, of course, go fishing and traveling around. Now, haven't some of your friends kind of questioned what you're doing here, Gordon? Uh, doing going way up north there? Oh, yes, the right. They wonder what do you what tell them? Well, I said, we're going to try it, at least. It's, um, uh, we've been up there in the winter. It's, uh, it gets quite cold. I think normal low around where it's about 30 below. It has hit 40 below, but it's very dry. It's not sloppy. Uh -huh. A lot of activity in the winter up there. and. My wife is bound determined to do cross-country skiing, and uh, we'll be getting the snowmobile, doing some ice fishing. How far into Canada are you? Oh, uh, by road, it's approximately 160 miles from International Falls. Uh, the, um, 
as a crow flies probably a hundred and a little better perspective might be that it's 200 miles east of Winnipeg. Are you near lots of people or a few people? Or are you by yourself? What? Well, we're on a peninsula on the lake. We have 125 foot of lake frontage and we're about three or four miles from a small village called Waldhof, which in German means a sm small opening by the trees or uh -huh. something of that nature. have a lot of friends up there and there's a yeah. post office. Uh, one of the uh, homeowners there has one room that becomes a post office. Yeah. We get our mail there. Then we're about eight miles from a little larger community where there's a general store, and and uh, and then we're 25 miles from Dryden, Ontario, which, uh, uh, although a very small city, less than 10,000, has full services, including the hospital. Mm -hmm. And so it. Uh, so you feel like you have everything you need. Everything we need, and we are so familiar with it. It's. Yeah. Uh, For 40 years you've been going up. You know the place. Right, and it's yeah. a lot of friends up there, and. Uh, So But we'll it's going to be different, Gordon. Well, it'll be different. Yes. And I guess with that, I would ask you another question because you've spent, well, you've spent parts of your years up there. Mm -hmm. Most of them and your work life has been here. And now that's going to change. Right. And I, I guess I'd ask you this, Gordon. Uh, what do you feel uh, are you going to miss the most when you leave and just come back occasionally to say hi? I'm going to miss driving in heavy traffic to work and heavy traffic home <laughs> is uh, one of the things I'm going to miss. <laughs> But not a lot. <laughs> and particularly when the weather is inclement and uh, snowing and all these sorts of things. No, it's rather facetious. But yeah, that's one of the main things I hate about it. Uh, I will miss the university. I'll miss the students. I thoroughly enjoy the interaction with the students and trying to resolve problems that uh, students are beset with that mm -hmm. they shouldn't be beset with. And, uh, work with the departments. Uh, um, Arts and Sciences has a great group of faculty. All the other colleges do too, but my, my efforts are devoted with the uh, Arts and Science faculty, and I found them open and receptive and really great people. I, uh, I'm going to miss that, mm -hmm. obviously. You can't help but miss mm -hmm. it. On the other hand, a lot of things I like to do. I'm a tinkerer. I'll be, uh, I like to take old outboard motors and tear them down and rebuild them, and, and uh, we'll be doing some remodeling work. Probably always be doing some remodeling. Do work. a lot more with your hands and less with your head. That's correct. Yeah. And, it, uh, and doing some fishing and some traveling. My wife, uh, of course, loves library, and she's hoping to get involved in some library things in Vermilion Bay, which has a school system there, or perhaps in, in Dryden. Mm -hmm. uh, And uh, she wants to do some traveling. We want to go from the East Coast to the West Coast of Canada. And one of the things we are definitely planning on doing is going up to Churchill, Manitoba, the polar bear capital of the world. Oh, they they yeah. run an excursion train uh, out of Thompson, which is north of Winnipeg, uh -huh. out there, and go up and then see what the bears are doing, among yeah. other things. But uh, Yeah, there's a vast country you're going to become a part very of. Very much so. You told me, though, before we started recording our reflections, that you weren't going to change your citizenship, though. You're going to still be a citizen of... We USA uh, and in essence Nebraska, right? Right. At, at this point, we have no intention of, of establishing citizenship up there. We wouldn't even be able to start the process for three years. Mm -hmm. We did have to go through a lengthy process of becoming what they call landed immigrants or residents. Uh, started that last September and, and finally got that completed uh, about the second week of March. Very complicated thing involving lots of documentation and physical exams and interviews and so mm -hmm. forth. But. Uh, uh, We, it was a necessary condition. If you spend more than 90 days up there, you have to establish residency right. no matter what. And we obviously will be probably spending the whole year up there. Uh -huh. Maybe it gets a little cabin fever. We might pop down to here or Mexico or something for a week or yeah. something like that. But generally, that's going to be basically your home. Right. Well, you have a lot of new things to look forward to, not just old things. Right. And, uh, and a lot of acquaintances and friends that you acquired over the years. I guess one last thing I'd ask you, Gordon. Uh, I asked you about what you'd miss, but I guess I'd ask you too, finally, uh, with all your years here as a student and as a mm -hmm. teacher and then as an administrator, very personal way, what has this University of Omaha and then University of Nebraska at Omaha meant to you? Well, it's, first of all, it's home. You know, it, it's a very comfortable place. I feel a part of it, not a part from it. it um, uh, There, I, I don't know what uh, the, the philosophy, I, I think again, I think the philosophy here is the openness, the fact of receptiveness to students, the quality of the institution, which has always astounded me as a small school, and, and like Del Weber says, the best kept secret in Omaha. Um, I've heard that over and over again from transfer students. Uh, they're always amazed what they run into here. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, I can't help but yes, I'll, I'll miss it. It's like I say, it, it, it is a part of me and it'll never be a part from me. It can't be. It's just, uh, it's a great campus. And, uh, great place to be. A great place to be, it is. It's and true. we're going to miss you. And I want to thank you for taking time to sit and reminisce with me and talk about the past and the present and the future, Gordon. Well, thank you, Paul. You know, as you become part of the elderly community, so to speak, we appreciate the way you teach, treat us old people. <laughs> <laughs> We're sitting here in the Health Physical Education Building and have been for about an hour, and I've been working with Dr. Gordon Hansen, reflecting on his life and times at the university, his personal life, what he's planning to do with he and his good wife in the years ahead. We've been doing another in our series that we refer to as Reflections in Time. Mm -hmm.